tonight we're going to be talking about the movie Batman Begins. This is going to be our first analysis of what we might call a modern hero myth. We did an introduction to hero myths, mythology. We said it was a story that has um, an investigation of really profound questions and answers, you know, questions of both cultural and universal human concerns. And modern movies comic books and things in that genre do much of those same things the way we saw in ancient mythology, right? We looked at Gilgamesh, we saw how that worked out, you know, the transformative hero story, and I think Batman Begins is also a great example of a transformative story. Now, I might be a little bit biased being a huge Batman fan, but I think uh, most people would agree that this is not just a good superhero movie it's actually a very good film and there are a lot of things that the director writer does to stick to the traditional hero's journey motif the monomyth structure so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the film i'll be showing various clips and analyzing clips or at least talking about some of the motifs as they show up and the other thing that i want to do as we delve into the movie is analyze some other archetypes i brought up this idea of archetypal imagery archetypes um, Jungian archetypes as we've talked in the past, particularly when we discussed the trickster hero. I'm going to do the same thing today. I'm going to introduce you to a couple more archetypes as we go and show you how those are used in the film. Now, I don't always know if the writer-director had all these things in mind consciously when they wrote the script and made the movie. At some level, I think they probably did know quite a bit about how hero stories present themselves. Um, and maybe drawing on some of these ideas when they write. Um, but it's also possible that these things can happen accidentally. Like I said, hero stories from around the world seem to fit a basic pattern. And that pattern, remember, is based off of our experience of reality as human beings because it's not just the story of the hero in the movie or the book or the myth. It's our life, right? We are, in a way, the hero. So let's take a look at Batman Begins. This is going to be a good overview of how to analyze a movie as a hero's journey. So if you're in the class, you will be writing a paper doing this very thing. So this is, in a way, preparation for that. So let's take a look at Batman Begins. And we're going to start by looking at the three-act structure, right? We've got Act 1, 2, and 3. We said Campbell refers to them as the separation, initiation, and return phases of the hero's journey. And you can play with these things, right? Sometimes Act 1 is very brief. Act 2 is almost always the biggest portion of any film or story. And then Act 3, the resolution, is usually going to be some kind of very short wrap-up at the end, right? Now, you could make Act 1 or Act 3 longer than normal. And in this movie, I love the way that they present Act 1 and Act 2 as kind of mixing together. It's like a back and forth. So when I introduce this first clip... Um, it's basically act one, but we're going to do kind of a flash forward, flash backward type of a thing, which also should remind you of this technique in epic literature where you start in medias race, the idea of beginning in the middle, okay, and then going back to fill in the gaps. And they do this very well in the movie, right, um, piece by piece. So let's kind of watch some of these scenes. I may stop some of them in the middle and talk. Um, sometimes I'll let them play out. They're, none of them are really too, too long. But let's take a look at this first really pivotal, pivotal moment in the life of young Bruce Wayne, who is our protagonist. Bruce? Ah! Now, as we go through the various scenes, pay attention to the visuals how the director, you know, plans the imagery because there are a lot of things going on in the movie that are obviously used on a symbolic level. The bat, I mean, you can't not you can't do Batman without bats. So, but that's part of the symbolism. It goes all the way back to the original character, which I'll talk a little bit about the origins of the character as we go uh, later on, but this whole idea of the bat being a creature that induces fear is core, you know, myth for Batman. Um Here's the moment, right, and when I call it Act 1 separation, I'm not saying he's actually separating at this part, moving into Act 2, but that's the phase that we're in. Here is a traumatic moment early in his life that's definitely going to have a, leave a scar, right? It's a developmental moment. It's actually a moment that begins a transformation in the character. So we're going to keep coming back to this idea of transformation, transformation, transformation. And the big thing that we're introduced to here is, um, first of all, the motif of the descent, 
into the underworld. You know, this is going to be done to death in this movie. And I, I personally like that, so it doesn't get on my nerves. We're going to, you know, show you various descents. As a matter of fact, the entire trilogy is set up by looking at this idea of descending and rising, right? Falling and rising. It's a theme that starts off here and continues through to the third movie in the trilogy. Okay, so that's going to be big. And you already know some of the things to look for when we talk about a descent. I went through that when we talked about Gilgamesh, right? The, the crossing of the waters of death, um, some of the motifs, the idea of crossing over some kind of boundary to another land, um, some type of... Uh, uh, new world where you're transitioning across something, okay? Uh, could be a downward movement, could be an upward movement, but we'll look at that as we go. And then the big theme, one of many, and I'll keep saying there's another theme, here's another theme, but the big theme that we're beginning with is this idea of fear, right? Falling and fear, which are united together. So as he descends, he's descending into essentially the underworld, the bats come out, they're dark, they're terrifying. He's a child. You can imagine how terrifying this would be. Right? Whether this is a dangerous situation, you know, obviously it's not, but it's enough to scar him permanently. Okay? And the permanent scar is actually going to come as a result of this initial scarring. So let's come back to that later. I don't want to get ahead of myself too much. Now, we're flash forwarding to Act 2 at this point. Okay? Now, m Act 2... We're still, in a way, in the des descent phase. Actually, we're looking at another f version of the descent motif. Um, you're in the initiation, so this is obviously the road of trials. This is where the hero is going through his testing. And again, that's going to be in different degrees. All right, Almost the entire Act 2 is one of one test followed by another test. So pay attention to this particular scene. This is where Bruce Wayne, now an adult, is in Asia, and he's actually in a prison. Okay, So um, very brief clip here. You Hell, Nietzsche man. And I am the devil. Okay, practice. Obviously, he's, again, this, he's testing himself, but where has he put himself? He's put himself in hell. I, I, I love the way they do the dialogue in the movie. Um, I don't want to say there's no wasted lines, but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that every line that's put in the mouth of a character is trying to highlight, again, these themes over and over again. I mean, it's not accidental that he says, you're in hell, right? I'm the devil. This is completely <laughs> underworld motif there. I mean, it's clear where we are. He hasn't gotten out from the pit, right? That's going to be the whole process of rising. Now, the next couple of scenes I'm going to show you go along with this. Um, he's still in the prison, um, but something is going to happen while he's in this prison. So this hell scene is now going to bring in a mentor figure. You have become truly lost. On what path can Raz al Ghul offer? The path of a man who shares his hatred of evil and wishes to serve true justice. Again, the language, you know, talking about how, fall he's, how far he's fallen, a criminal underworld, right? You're still using the same type of language of, you know, Hades, etc., now, the character of Ducard, and I know you should have already seen the movie, so I'm not going to spoil anything if I point out that this figure is also going to be Ra's al Ghul, who he's speaking about, okay, is going to function in a way as the mentor, right? He's coming into Bruce's life, not as a boy, as a man, but it's still in the midst of his training, right? He's training himself, but now he's going to have somebody that's going to guide him, craft him, mold him, shape him into the person that he's going to become. And he's offering him a purpose. He says, you become truly lost, which is really interesting because, you know, on this path, there are lots of different ways that we can go, right? So the idea is, you know, we make wrong turns here, wrong turns there, and the goal is always to get towards the thing that we're after, the, the boon, the quest, the ultimate reward at the end, which we can talk about as we go because there are levels of um, questing goals, um, but what he's doing is he's offering him not just a path and a purpose, which is really, really essential to your transformation, right? If you remember, I talked about the whole idea of the transcendent purpose of the hero narrative to kind of be a calling for transformation and not just, you know, you need to live your life this way, but give you a something to, um, what is it called? Something that, you know, reverberates within your soul, however you want to put it, something that resonates and um, gives you this sense of meaning, 
which drives you on. And he's trying to do this here, right? This idea of justice. And he knows the buttons to push, as we'll see. But it's a call to adventure. Okay, so that call to adventure happens in Campbell's monomyth, right? We talked about the 17 stages of Campbell's monomyth. The call to adventure usually comes in Act 1, and then there's often a refusal to answer that call before you eventually go into Act 2, the initiation. This is a call to adventure. It's not the first one. We'll see that there are earlier calls, in a way, when we go back to Act 1. So this is going to be one that is actually going to, in a way, be responded to because he's going to then go after what is being offered to him. So let's look at the next clip. The call is responded to, and he goes on his quest. Now, the quest, he's already on a quest, but let's take a look at the imagery in this scene as he's going to go pursue Ra's al Ghul, crossing away from the road, which kind of represents civilization, into the world of nature. This is kind of like Gilgamesh going up into the mountains as he's pursuing the land of Vitnapishtim. So even though he's going up, this is still what we can call a catabasis moment, right? A catabasis is this descent. And I love the way they end it because he gets to the top and there's this palace there. It's almost like he's reached the home of the gods, but it's more like, you know, the palace of Hades, I guess you could say. And he's beaten. He's you know, on the verge of death. I mean, you just look at the way he holds his body. He's a man who has been broken and then the doors open. And what does he do? But he crosses the threshold. That moment is what Campbell uses to transition between Act 1 and Act 2, right? The crossing of the threshold. He's responded to the call to adventure that Ra's al Ghul has presented him, and then he crosses over into this new world, okay? And he's not ready for this. And that's what um, Ducard or Ra's al Ghul is going to, you know, present him with in a second, the fact that you got to always be ready, okay? You might not feel like you're ready, but, you know, death doesn't wait for anybody. So let's actually take a look at that scene very quickly as well. What are you seeking? I seek for the means to fight injustice. That's the to goal. Turn fear against those who prey on the fearful. Okay, his goal, his quest, has to do with fear. Again, this goes to the core of his personality, core of his character. It's what drives him. Okay, and how to use that fear really as a weapon to pursue justice. And one of the big theories. Yeah, yeah, some of the audio is a little hard to hear. Um, <clears throat> but um, the pursuit of justice we're going to look at as well because that's another theme. Is what exactly does that mean, to pursue justice? You know, are there, there, are there boundaries of what's just versus what's vengeance? All right, that's a big question that's analyzed as well. So um, let's move on and look at uh, Ducard's response here. It does not wait for you to be ready. Death is not considerate warfare. And make no mistake, here you face death. Okay, so again, if it wasn't clear that he has descended into hell and he's climbing the mountain, it's very clear that what he faces now is death. This is another encounter with death. And again, you can't have a hero story if you don't have a conquest of death, so this conquest is what we're looking at. And that, that again, doesn't have to literally be the, the destruction of death itself or anything like that. Remember, death could be viewed in various ways. And Bruce is going to die in the course of his quest, right? He's going to come out transformed. So that's one way that we can understand it, okay? But here we are. This is a transformative moment. Let's talk about the archetype now of the shadow. Where he's gone as he's climbed this mountain is to study with a group that are known as the League of Shadows, which is an appropriate name. Because this group, in particular Ducard, Ra's al Ghul, represents an archetype that we find in Jungian psychology. And the shadow is one of the key archetypes. Um, here we're talking about, again, confronting fear, death, the inner aspects of the personality that the shadow represents. So if we're going to define the shadow, it would be something like this. It's the side of one's personality that ultimately is repressed. This is the side of you that you don't want to acknowledge. Um, it's there, sometimes unconsciously. It's definitely negative, has some dark aspects to it. That's why it's called the shadow. And they're, like I said, un unacceptable aspects of the personality. All right, as, you, as you grow up, you know, you, you see certain things in yourself that you don't like. Maybe society kind of frowns upon this, you know, uh, aspect of your desires or that, and you kind of cover them up, hide them away, and forget about them. But the unconscious side of your personality is always with you, 
And even though the conscious mind doesn't want to identify it, it emerges in certain places. So for instance, we tend to project the shadow onto other people in that we can notice deficiencies in other people's personalities where we might overlook the very same deficiency in ourself. Because again, unconsciously, we're aware of what's going on. Okay. Um, now, they're also generally come out through dreams, um, through myths. That's the way these things emerge. We talked about that when we looked at the you know, inner... Uh, inner interpretation theories or internalist uh, interpretation theories early in the semester. But the shadow is generally represented in these stories as a figure of the same sex. Okay, so if the protagonist or the main hero is a, a male, the shadow is generally going to be also uh, a male figure. Okay, now that's not necessarily a hard and fast rule as far as I know, but that's a general truth. Bruce... <clears throat> has a few things that he is wrestling with. We've already talked about them, right? It's going to be fear. Guilt, we haven't really addressed yet, but that's a real, real important one. We're going to see where that comes in in a second. And then he's got this desire for justice, this um, thing that he's craving, right? He, when he was asked by Ra's al Ghul, what are you seeking? He says the means to fight injustice. Now, the question at this point is, um, what's vengeance and what's justice? Are those two things the same? Are they different in any way? And you're going to have some interesting dialogue later which tries to distinguish where justice and, and, and vengeance actually depart. And it actually has to do more of on, uh, with more respect to um, your emotional response, right? Justice being something that should be impartial, whereas vengeance is something that draws upon your desires and makes you feel good to get vengeance. Matter of fact, if you ever read Aristotle, all right, he's Nicomachean Ethics, where he talks about, you know, his ethical theory known as virtue ethics. He talks a lot about um, the emotions. And one of the things that he says with respect to the emotion of anger is that it brings with it a natural desire for revenge. And revenge is a pleasure that we seek. Okay, but he also talks about revenge as somewhat of a cognate to justice because they do seek a lot of the same things. Right? They seek retribution, they seek deterrence, they seek um, you know, somebody knowing um, why they're being punished. You know, the, 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 all the types of things justice tries to accomplish, vengeance has you know, a parallel to that. So it is a confusion, right? What, what's the difference? And for Bruce, we don't know yet, okay? And of course, we're going to see how that works itself out in the story. Now, the side of Bruce, Bruce with which he struggles is represented, I think, by Ducard or by Ra's al Ghul, and definitely by the League of Shadows, right? Like I said, it's appropriately named. As a matter of fact, what's very interesting about the name League of Shadows is that in the comic books, there is this same organization led by Ra's al Ghul that it goes by a different name, which I'm going to get to in a second. But let's, let's look at this word, the shadow, uh, for a second, because one of the inspirations for the character of Batman, going all the way back to the 1930s, was another pulp um, fiction character by the name of The Shadow. I don't know how many of you guys have ever heard of The Shadow. Uh, if you have, go ahead and put it in the chat so I know that you're following me. Um, you may be familiar. There was a movie that came out, I believe, in the 1990s uh, called The Shadow with Alec Baldwin playing the role. But, you know, it was a very popular pulp action star back in the 30s, in the 40s, and even on up. Uh, you know, there's a radio program, movie serials, things like that. But the character is a vigilante. He's very much like the Batman. He's kind of masked to a degree. He's very dark. Um, it was an inspiration for the creator. Batman, created by you know uh, Bob Kane, Bill Finger, back in 1939, made his appearance after The Shadow. So they have actually acknowledged that Batman was modeled, in a way, on this character, uh, which is kind of neat. But when it comes to the League, as it emerges in the comic books in the 1960s, you've got a League known as the League of Assassins. Some of you may be familiar with that version of the League, if you've watched any of the... Um, DC TV series like Arrow or something like that. They have the League of Assassins active in some of those shows. But they chose to change the name for the movie, and I'm not sure if they did this intentionally to try to draw um, the parallel with Jungian archetypes or not. Um, it's a possibility. Um, it's a pretty cool name either way. Whether you go League of Assassins, League of Shadows, um, they both work. Okay. So kind of an interesting archetype. So pay attention for that. We're going to see another figure in the movie as well that really fits the archetype of the shadow. Now, let's talk about the conquest of death. We're going to do a flashback now to Act 1, picking up where the other flashback kind of left off. All right, so as 
the fall motif is important, right? Descending into the underworld. The other half of that experience is the coming back, the rising from the dead or the emergence. Quite a fall, didn't we, Master Bruce? And why do we fall, Bruce? So we can learn to pick ourselves up. Key line right there. Why do we fall? Right? Why do we fall? To learn to pick ourselves back up. So this whole thing that they're two halves of the of a coin, really. Um, this is a pretty important scene. I know the audio is not necessarily easy to hear. I'm actually going to try to adjust it if I can. So um, let me boost that up for a second. We'll see if that works. Um, a couple of things that are important in this scene, obviously not just the idea of rising, right, is the introduction of his father, right? The father figure is incredibly important to who Bruce Wayne is. Here you've got the guy coming down to bring his son out of the pit, out of the well, right? Takes him by the hand. I don't know if the imagery specifically is supposed to be, you know, parallel to kind of the creation moment in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel painting, right, where you've got God reaching out to Adam. Uh, in a way, you know, in religious traditions, you've got that imagery of, you know, God descending to, you know, rescue his falling creature or the father figure with his son, which is what you have here. So again, it's an interesting theme. See how they shoot it. You know, the idea of their hands clasping is kind of a powerful image. So this is a father who obviously cares about his son. Okay. The other thing that's really interesting in this scene is when he comes by the young girl, right? This is going to be Rachel. She has a really important role to play in the film, and he hands her this arrowhead, right? This stone arrowhead that is what they were fighting, not fighting over, but kind of playing around with when he fell into the well originally. Um, in a way, that kind of represents this moment in their lives, right? This traumatic event. And it, again, that image of the arrowhead is going to come back later in the story because she keeps that. Right? And she remembers this point and the connection that they had as friends, as children. And that's going to be really, really important for his further development. Okay, So that's kind of a, a totem, I guess you could say, uh, for the character. Right? So here we've got this, this theme of rising. Really important. And like I said, it goes all the way through to the last movie, which is called The Dark Knight Rises. And if you remember, we saw some clips of this when we talked about fear and we talked about... Um, what was the other thing? When we did Pandora, we talked about hope. I, I, I showed you scenes from the third movie where Bruce was again in that pit, which looks exactly like the well he fell into as a child. Of course, they did that intentionally and you know brilliantly. I think that's a, that's a neat way to link these movies together to follow a theme all the way through. Okay, <clears throat> now let's move on to another. And maybe the more traumatic event from his childhood, which is going to represent the unique birth. In the stories we've looked at, this idea of the unique birth uh, scene, it happens in different ways, right? We talked about you know Luke Skywalker having a unique birth, how you know, his mother dies in childbirth. That's literally a birth scene. For young heroes, right, the, 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 um, the, the myth of the birth of the hero that Rank talks about is not necessarily something that happens at the moment of birth, but something that happens early in the development of the character, usually in childhood. So here we're dealing with what is going to be the birth of the character, the birth of the hero, okay? But of course, there's a lot of development that needs to follow. So let's look at a few clips from this particular scene. And Okay, he wants to go, right? He is in the theater with his parents. It's a nice night out, apparently, except they're at the opera. And they're watching a show that is obviously recalling the visions of the bats, right? There's bats in the play. It's a very dark scene. If you don't know anything about the opera that they happen to be seeing, it's an opera by the name of Mephistopheles, which happens to deal with the um, Germanic story of Faust, a uh, character who, um, you know, Mephistopheles is the um, figure that represents Satan, who's after the soul of Faust. Um, anyways, this was an Italian opera, and it's appropriate because, again, the, the, the director, the writer, is trying to bring back that theme of underworld, death, and it's traumatic, right? 
So it's really well selected because if you know anything, again, about the original story of Batman or how it's been told, his origin story over the years, it was originally a theater. He went to the movies to see a movie known as, if I'm getting, I sometimes get different versions of the film confused. I think it's The Mark of Zorro. I was about to say The Mask of Zorro, which I think is the Antonio Banderas one from a while ago. But The Mark of Zorro was supposedly the movie that he went to see the night that his parents are killed. Spoiler alert. But, and again, that goes back to that idea of here's another masked figure wearing all black that is an inspiration to the Batman figure, which is why they made it, you know, the Zorro film. But in this, they kind of depart with that. And they go, I think, with something that is really appropriate to the theme of the movie, fear, okay, and the bats and um, the witches and all the stuff that are on the stage. So it's now he's terrified, right? It's bringing back this fear. And what he asked his father to do is get up and leave, okay, which doesn't seem like a big deal. And the father, who really cares about his son, is going to be more than willing to do this. But the consequences are going to be drastic. And that's the worst part of this whole scene. So let's take a look. Got the encounter with fear in the opera. And then here's where it goes from there. It's fine. It's fine. Now just take it and go. I said you were... His last words, right? Don't be afraid. Perfectly placed. The last thing he hears from his father, the most traumatic moment of his early life. This is the birth moment. But it's not just a birth moment. In a way, the death of his parents function in a secondary way as the call to adventure. Really the first call to adventure that he's had, right? And falling into the well is a traumatic moment, but it's not a birth, all right? It begins his fear. And now the, the complexity is that his fear is what caused him to ask his parents to leave the opera, which directly led to their death. This is where the guilt comes in, right? He feels responsible, and I'm probably getting a little bit ahead because we're going to look at a clip where he talks about this. Um, but he's also confronted at the same time because multiple elements can happen at any one moment. You get the adversary. And I'm not talking about the particular man that killed his parents, Joe Chill. He is, I want to say, a minor character. He plays a major role, but he's not a major personality in the whole Batman mythos. But he represents more just the idea of criminality, which is really the main adversary to Batman. It's not any one particular cr criminal, right? The Joker may be an arch nemesis. Ra's al Ghul may be incredibly important. But it's crime in general, all right? So he's now confronted with a problem in the world, Right? And this is what cost him his, his parents' his life. So in a way, he's actually being called to face something. And is he going to respond? Well, he's not really in a position to yet. So you could think of, you know, here Campbell introducing the call to adventure and the hero's refusal of the call, right, is going to basically be him delaying until much later in life where he's going to respond. And as a matter of fact, he doesn't respond in the right way. So he doesn't actually go on the path that he needs to go on, as you'll see in a little bit. So again, you've seen the movie, hopefully, and you know where this is going. But let's talk about what emerges next. The exile, right? The loss of identity. Here we're going to look at kind of a mixture of scenes, Act 1 and 2. I edited it, but they're really right there next to each other. So I'm going to just call this Act 1 and Act 2. We're going to see separation and then into the initiation stage in, in just a, a brief moment. But pay attention to the imagery. I like the way this scene is set up. Uh, it's basically the funeral for his parents has just ended. He's alone. You know, here he is in the mansion, but isolated, right? He's kind of cut off from the people that he cares about outside, from the world that he once knew, from his parents. The idea of his solitary confinement is, you know, obvious in the way the scene is shot. So this is the whole exile motif, right? He is, uh, you know, he lost his family. That's about the biggest exile one can have. But he's also lost his identity. So pay attention to how... Bruce Wayne is going to wrestle with the memory of his father, the, uh, the Wayne name, um, all that kind of stuff is really going to come into question as he grows into a man. Okay, so the exile loss of identity is really important. Here's that innocence. He's waving goodbye to it in a way. Yes, Master Bruce. 
I meant no, to leave no, the theater no, 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 no. if I hadn't gotten escape. It was nothing that you did. It was him and him alone. Do you still feel responsible for your parents' death? My anger outweighs my guilt. Come. Your anger gives you great power. But if you let it, it will destroy you. As it almost did me. What stopped it? Vengeance. That's no help to me. Why, Bruce? Why could you not avenge your parents? Okay, I probably should have cut that into a number of clips because there really is a lot going on there. I've talked about in the beginning, right, the funeral scene, the exile, the loss of identity. Uh, and we're introduced to the figure of Alfred. Um, it's not the first time we've seen him, but um, really, really amazing role um, in, in, in Bruce's life, right? This is basically the surrogate father. This is the guy that's going to raise the character. So he's definitely the mentor figure. And unlike many mentor figures in mythology, he's not a figure that's going to disappear from the life of the hero. He's going to come along and become essentially an ally of Bruce later on in his actual mission. Um, love the casting. I, I probably have said this before. I think the movie uh, had in, one of the best casts ever put together for a Batman film. Um, and I think Michael Caine is the best guy that has ever played the role of Alfred. But the words that he speaks to him, I mean, just pay attention if you watch the movie again to you know, the advice that he gives him. It's, it's always completely appropriate and the perfect words of wisdom so it's not going to sink in all the time, right? It's like any child, you know, being mentored by somebody. They don't always receive the advice. You know, you look back at words of wisdom down the road and you realize how true these things are. But he still feels guilty. I mean, even years later, he even says when he's talking to Ducard that his anger outweighs his guilt. He still feels guilty. So that's a big theme, right? That's what we were talking about before. Now, you've got Ducard training him down the road. This is the Act 2 section where he is also a mentor. But in this relationship. He's not going to be a mentor slash ally the way Alfred is. Ducard is going to be a mentor slash adversary or slash trickster, right? There's a, a bit of a deception with Ducard. I've already spoiled it for you, said that he's actually Ra's al Ghul. He doesn't realize that. Bruce doesn't realize that at the moment. But that's part of the trick. It's part of the deceit. It's part of the idea of using illusion and theatricality, as he puts it, okay? Um, to upset the order. This is the entire thing with Ducard. He's a trickster character who's about to upset the order that there is in order to reestablish a better order or a new order, right? Now, his mission has to do with vengeance, right? So we have that discussion that goes in here. But prior to that discussion on vengeance is, and it's related to it, is his discussion of Bruce's father. Notice how he keeps bringing up the father figure in the course of his training, okay? So again, Road of Trials, Lesson on Guilt and Fear, purpose, and then the issue of justice comes up. Um, he basically blames Bruce's father for his own death. And of course, this is going to cut right to the heart of the character of Bruce Wayne. All right, he doesn't want to hear that. You know, you don't know my father. Okay, but we find out by the end of the conversation, right, you get this alienation that's kind of creeping in, this distancing, which we'll see in other scenes. Uh, but the, um, you know, this kind of throws Bruce's world, like I said, into further chaos as a trickster. But the interesting thing about Ducard as a shadow figure is when he talks about his own experience, it's a parallel to Bruce's experience, right? He lost somebody that he loves, right? And you get to the point, I think he says in this scene, that you, you even want to forget, you know, that that person was ever in your life just so you don't have to deal with the pain, right? You want to forget about it. Um, so he's got this, his wife basically that he lost that drives him towards vengeance. And he basically deals with his pain through his quest for vengeance, right? And he's kind of telling Bruce, this is the way you need to go. You need to go down this path. But the question is, is that the right path? Okay. So we're going to see, of course, how Bruce responds to this shortly. Now let's do a flashback because we're still back forth, back and forth between act one and two. This is going to stop very soon. So let's talk about this alienation as we're getting set to end Act 1. Act 1 basically starts to wrap up very soon. So I think I've got a couple clips to watch that deal with this. So this first one is going to have to do with his relationship with his father. So if you don't remember the scene or if you haven't seen the movie, here's Bruce. This is earlier. He's an adult, but it's still earlier than his journey that we just looked at. He's come back home to Wayne Manor after being away in school. 
pay attention to what they're talking about and how Bruce responds to his home and his memory of his father, okay? I prepared the master bedroom. No. My room will be fine. With all due respect, sir, Wayne Manor is your house. No, Alfred, it's my father's house. Your father is dead. Well, this place Wayne. is a mausoleum. If I have my way, I'll pull the damn thing down brick by brick. This house, Master Wayne, has sheltered six generations of your family. Why do you give a damn, Alfred? It's not your family. I give a damn because a good man once made me responsible for what was most precious to him in our world. His house is a mausoleum, right? I mean, his parents have died, obviously, but notice the way they've draped everything in the sheets, right? This is like going into a, a ghost house. Um, it's a mausoleum. He wants to just tear it down. The whole memory of his past, he just wants to abolish it all. He doesn't want the master bedroom, right? Because that's his father's bedroom, right? He's not his father. He's distancing himself from the memory of his father. And it's all due to this pain and this guilt, but it's very vivid. And of course, Alfred, who's kind of taken the place of his dad, right? Raised him, um, is, is rejected at the same time. He right? said, it's not your family. I mean, these are, these are hurtful, painful words, Right, so it's interesting as far as, like I said, a superhero movie, it's sometimes the scenes that have the least amount of action that are going to be the most profound scenes in the film. But uh, it gives you, again, a good glimpse as to where his character has progressed from that childhood experience. All right, so return to Wayne Manor. It's in exile. He's still in exile. He's going to live like he's in exile. He's not going to go to the master bedroom. Right, he's alienated. Uh, now, also in this scene, and I don't I think I have a clip of this, but he has his reunion for the first time in a long while with Rachel. So that's the little girl that we saw in the beginning of the movie that he gave the arrowhead back to, um, and he waved, you know, goodbye to her at the funeral scene. Right, it's like you know, my past life is over, uh, which was really neatly done. I think I may have said that. I don't remember if I did, but he's going to have a reunion with her. And this is all preparation to go to the parole hearing for the guy that murdered his father. That's why he's back home. Okay, so let's actually go on to the parole hearing where we're going to see, again, his refusal to answer the call that's been given so far, which is, again, when his parents were killed. So let's see how this works out. And um, two things that are going to be in this scene, we're going to look at kind of what happens after the parole hearing, and then we're going to look at where... Rachel brings him and her conversation with him. And I've edited it up a little bit to make it shorter than it should have been. Uh, Tony paid him off to get chill out in the open. Maybe I should be thanking them. You don't mean that. What if I do, Rachel? My parents deserve justice. Well, you're not talking about justice. You're talking about revenge. Well, sometimes they're the same. No, they're never the same, Bruce. Justice is about harmony. Revenge is about you making yourself feel better. What chance does Gotham have when the good people do nothing? I'm not one of your good people, Rachel. What do you mean? All these years, I wanted to kill him. Now I can't. Your father would be ashamed of you. Okay, this is probably the most important call to adventure scene in the film. And it's a little bit lengthy, like I said, but again, a lot of stuff is going on here. You get the contemplation of murder, right? He's about to kill this guy that is, um, you know, out in the open. Um, you know, this public uh, parole hearing, which was set up by the, um, you know, Carmen Falcone, uh, the uh, the guy in the. The mob there that we are introduced to very shortly, which I actually cut off here. Um, so the, if you know anything again about the Batman character, the, one of the, the key parts of the Batman code is that he doesn't use you know, a firearm or he doesn't kill. All right, there are certain lines that you don't ever cross, and they're investigating this in this scene. Of course, he's contemplated crossing that line. Um, it was a very serious contemplation. He would have done it. I mean, you get the feeling that he was about to do it, except that somebody got to him before Bruce could. Um, of course, if you know anything, again, about the history of the character, originally back in 1939, in the early 40s, Batman actually did carry a gun. He actually wore you know, a sidearm because, um, again, he was modeled a lot more on the figure of the shadow and some of the things going on in the pulp magazines. Um, but it becomes pretty much a core aspect of the, the mythos to say Batman never, ever kills. So they're playing with that scene, right? He's contemplating it. But then he has this conversation with Rachel. 
So Rachel is going to be the conscience coming to really challenge him. And when they start their drive, notice they're in the daylight, right? They're out in the open, and then she takes his turn, right? He's saying, you know, you're, you're, the conversation's already on this idea of justice versus vengeance and, uh, you know, everything that we just talked about a little bit earlier. And she, he says, you know, the system's broke, which he's right. I mean, the system is utterly corrupt. The whole idea of Gotham is that it's corrupt at every single level, right? From the, the, the street cop to the district attorney's office to the, the judges and all that kind of stuff. But she brings him right down again into the underworld, essentially. Notice how it gets dark. He goes down to where, you know, the mob's meeting in this shady restaurant. Uh, they got the guys down there. It's, it's, it's the, the worst place to go. And at the same time, there's the doorway, and there on the other side is the real villain, right? The guy that's running the show in Gotham. I love the way the music kind of trails off, and you have this dead silence right before she slaps him, right? She's already talking to him about your father, you know, what kind of man your father was. So, you know, I just love, again, the way they deal with that whole theme of, you know, what that means. You know, kind of man your father was, which is supposed to be kind of a guiding force to how you ought to, you know, evolve. But you know, he says, you know, I'm not one of your good people. And she slaps him, right? Literally knocking some sense into him at this point. So let's talk a little bit about this call, because what happens right afterward as she essentially gives him this wake up, call to adventure, slap across the face, is he gets out of the car, thinks about the gun and the way he's going, the, the, the trail he's running down, and he decides to stop and he throws it away, right? Which is smart because he then goes into the mob bar where they you know, frisk him and of course he has a confrontation with Falcone and immediately when he leaves, um, you're actually going to have him answering the call. That's why this is important because he's been called before, he hasn't answered the call. At this moment, he's going to answer the call. So let me just um, bring up some of the text on the screen. So, you know, Rachel is going to be a counsel to Bruce. This is her the second call to adventure. He throws the, away the gun, which kind of represents him answering the call. Then he goes in, meets with Falcone, and he crosses another threshold, right? He goes again through the doorway into the bar, into the pit of hell, and he's going to be off on his journey. And notice what happens before he actually leaves, and this scene concludes. He takes off his coat. Which I thought was brilliantly done, right? The the coat that he has, the coat of a Wayne, the you know the upper class rich boy, and he wants to give away that identity. He wants to take on the coat of the homeless guy who he exchanges it with. That's the separation moment, right? He's leaving his past behind. He's now going kind of like Gilgamesh did in the the clothes of kind of rags off into the world. And what does he get on? He gets on a boat, right? He goes down to the port and he gets on a boat the same way Gilgamesh got on a boat to cross the waters of death. That is essentially the end of Act 2. The flashbacks at that point stop. We're now, I'm sorry, the end of Act 1. We're now completely in Act 2, okay? So let's bring up the next archetype that I want to talk about. We've seen the shadow. Now let's talk about the anima. It's one of the primary archetypes. In Jungian psychology, there are archetypes at different levels. The primary archetypes are usually the shadow, the anima, the animus, and the self. The anima could be defined as the unconscious feminine aspect within a male psyche. It is the way Jung viewed, viewed it. Okay? And the animus, by contrast, would be the unconscious masculine aspect within a female psyche. The way he believed it functioned was to awaken um, one to the emotional side, spiritual side, creative, imaginative, and sensitive side of one's personality. Right? And it aids in your individuation of yourself, which you ultimately want is to develop the self. So that's the, the other archetype that you know, we're trying to reach. This is kind of a quest, um, you know, the, the uh, individuation of the self. We'll talk about that in a little bit, maybe even I, maybe in the next couple of slides. I forget when I include that. But it's a relational archetype. Uh, it's supposed to govern the way a man relates to a woman. Right? It's a kind of built in an innate guide to interacting with the opposite sex and various relationships. So when it comes to this general anima, it manifests itself in different uh, forms. So for instance, for Jung, there were at least four levels of the anima archetype. There would be the Eve, Helen, Mary, and the Sophia. All of these actually come from either Greek words or mythology in general. So Eve, we've already talked about when we did the story in the Garden of Eden. Right? This is a picture of woman as a nourisher, sense of security, love, kind of the motherly figure to a degree. 
the character of Helen taken from the story of Troy, right? This is a woman as capable, intelligent, insightful, a different aspect of the female. Mary, which would have been drawn from the Gospels. This is the mother of Jesus, which shows woman more as virtuous, okay, um, noble. And then Sophia, which is basically the Greek word for wisdom. It's a feminine term. So it's, again, woman as a particular individual, not as um, flat and one-dimensional as maybe the earlier archetypes there, the earlier levels of the anima, but um, kind of a more complicated uh, three-dimensional personality, positive and negative qualities combined. Okay, so you kind of you, you evolve in your perception of women as you grow. Now, Within the anima, you've got these sub-archetypes that we could talk about. So the anima can manifest itself as the mother archetype or the maiden archetype or the crone, the seductress, the huntress. There's lots of different forms of the feminine. And for instance, when we talk about there being a negative or positive, almost every archetype has a negative positive side. We talked about that with the trickster. Right? The trickster could be positive. They can often challenge a corrupt order. Um, introduce a little bit of chaos for some kind of good end. But you also have the idea of the trickster as deceitful and negative, especially when they encounter a positive um, order like Set or Loki, you know, overthrowing, you know, uh, Osiris or Balder. Okay, so for the mother archetype, for instance, that would be the relationship that is, you know, parent-child relationship. Positive side, you've got the nurturing aspect of the mother. Like you might be represented in somebody like a Mary. Um, a negative aspect would be kind of the oppressive, devouring mother that doesn't let the child emerge or grow into an adult male, um, grow up to be a man. This would be like the Gorgon, which is kind of a monstrous figure in mythology, but it's kind of a feminine terror that is kind of this devouring mother um, motif. So Rachel's kind of complex, right? She is the anima figure in the movie. Right? She represents a lot of different things. For instance, she is, in some sense, a mother figure. Now, I might be pushing this a little bit when I uh, you know, make that connection, but you know, this is his relationship with her, maybe I should say, is a flashback to a moment in his life when he was a child. Right? That's what he remembers about her most. They were friends at that stage of life, right? when he was a boy. So for him, kind of a flashback. This is when he had a mother. This is uh, in some ways, uh, an interesting relationship at that level. But he's also a romantic interest. I mean, she's his age. He grew up together. He clearly uh, is attracted to her um, in various ways. But that brings out some interesting tension because the idea of a mother figure and a romantic interest combined into one gets to be a little bit Oedipal, right? We talked about the Oedipus myth. Hopefully you remember what that was, where Oedipus ended up marrying his mother, you know, kind of Freudian psychology, the idea of the Oedipus complex where the male has this, you know, uh, relationship or desire for the mother in a sexual way. Rachel's also acting as a conscience here, right? It's almost like the uh, angel sitting on your shoulder tapping you saying, you know, don't do this, don't do that, um, kind of a figure. She is um, a Sophia, I guess, in that sense, in that she's providing a, a certain amount of wisdom to guide him. And at the same time, she's a potential temptress. So it's got this positive and negative all bound up in the same figure, though I don't want to make her sound like she's a negative character. When I say she's a potential temptress, she is to the degree that she causes him to want to depart from his ultimate goal, pull him away from his quest to fight crime, right, to, to be what he ultimately evolves into. And this really comes out, if you haven't seen it, in the second movie, The Dark Knight, okay, where we really investigate his relationship to her and the idea that you know, if he wants to be with her, he needs to stop and put aside the Batman identity, okay, and, you know, when's the right time to do that? Can that be done, right? So in that sense, you know, there's a little bit of that temp temp temptress aspect. So if you haven't seen it, some people think this is the best of the three movies, um, I think it's fantastic. It's not my favorite. I tend to prefer the first and third movies for different reasons, but it is a brilliant film, and you definitely can't go wrong. Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker, I still think, is the best that has been done. Okay, so let's go through a, kind of the movement of the story a little bit more quickly. I'm going to show fewer clips, at least in the immediate time, and talk about where the movie goes. So you've got the journey beginning, right? He's gone off. He boards the ship. Uh, it's basically entering the belly of the whale. This is the way Campbell describes it, the belly of the whale stage. This is essentially the entrance into the labyrinth or a descent into the underworld on its own. And we'll look at that later when we watch movies like uh, Ready Player One has this kind of idea. Um, so I, I may unpack this a little bit later, but 
Campbell and various others refer to this stage as kind of an inward journey, right? You're going inward. The idea of going into a labyrinth is kind of going back into one's own psyche, uh, into the unconscious, um, not necessarily into an actual labyrinth or into actual belly of, a, belly of a whale. All right, so that's what happens next. He ends up with the league, as we saw before, because that's where he was training. And we start to see his transformation moving along, right? He has a partial success in facing his fear when it comes to the test up in the temple. They have the, the, the chemical that they're using to induce the fear, right? The hallucinogenic drug that they're playing around with. They have the the box that has the bats in it, right? So as he's going through this test, the box is opened up and the bats fly out, representing his primal fear that he's wrestling with. And you see how he cowers for a moment and then goes on to successfully pass the test, which is kind of a first stage transformation of his character. And then immediately after passing that test, he's given his final test. And this is really a very important test because it's gonna be uh, whether or not he's gonna follow the path towards vengeance or go off in a different direction. And they ask him to kill was a criminal, or actually a murderer. Um, so you could actually make the case that the guy deserves what he is going to get. But Bruce Wayne says, no, this is not justice at that point, right? He's going to kind of set the, the boundaries. And he's going to reject the League's methods, reject the League's goals. And that, in a sense, is his conquest um, and transformation stage two. Okay? And of course, all hell breaks loose then, right? You have the burning of the temple. You've got Ra's al Ghul apparently dying. You've got Ducard being rescued by Bruce. Um, you know, that world is over. And that essentially moves us back to what appears to be a return motif, right? He is, he's done with that, that part of his journey. And I say that part of his journey because he really hasn't finished his transformation. We're still in Act 2. He gets back on a plane. He's flying back to Gotham with Alfred. And the question is, are we now in Act 3? And the short answer is no, we're not in Act 3 yet. The conversation is interesting because he talks about this quest for a crime-free Gotham, right? The thing that he's after and how he's going to then develop this new persona, the hero motif. Okay, he's going to take on a symbolic aspect to try to be more effective in pursuing justice the way he thinks is the appropriate way. Okay, that's an interesting conversation. I'll set that aside for the moment, but it's not really an act three because he's not coming back home in a way that wraps up the transformation, right? So even though he's coming back to his hometown, the transformation progresses. As a matter of fact, the adventure escalates because we haven't actually arrived at the pinnacle of the confrontation that's coming. You also have the introduction of another shadow figure uh, around this point in the movie, which is the figure of Jonathan Crane, Dr. Crane, is a psychologist who's in charge of the Falcone case. Um, he represents Falcone in a certain way. And he is the Scarecrow. If you're not familiar with the character from the comic books, he's one of the arch-villains of the Batman. And he represents fear. And the reason I say he's another shadow figure, not just because he's an adversary and a villain, he is not the main adversary or villain, but he is an embodiment of fear, which is the prime emotion driving Bruce Wayne from the very beginning. Like I said, the shadow should be a dark reflection of the character, I think, when done well. We said Ra's al Ghul or Ducard is a reflection of Bruce, but so is, is Crane. Bruce wants to use fear as a weapon. Crane has really mastered this in, in a certain way. He actually has found a way to use these chemicals, right, to induce fear within people, to manipulate them in certain ways. So he is, again, the wrong way to use fear, where Bruce Wayne is going to try to do it in a different way. So he is, again, the shadow figure, and, and very well done. All right, let's go back to another descent figure, uh, figure um, scene, a descent scene. This is another one that's really kind of powerful. I'll talk through most of this because it's basically just music, if I can talk over the music. But he's back home. He's going back to where he fell in the well. He's uncovering this thing. It's obviously been covered for some time. Just like his father, same image. He's going down into the well. It's almost like an idea that he's, in a way, maybe becoming his father. All right, 
kind of a powerful scene, a lot of CGI going on, but again, he is in his next catabasis, right? That's the word I want you to know. An ascent into the cave, which is going to become the Bat Cave. You can't have Batman really without a Bat Cave. Uh, kind of an underworld experience, but notice his reaction here is initially he cowers like he did in the temple, but then he rises and faces it, stands up erect, and this is the courageous moment. Remember, the hero doesn't have to uh, get rid of all fear in order to be the hero, to be courageous. As a matter of fact, if you didn't have fear, remember, you can't be courageous. Courage requires fear. So it's always going to be there. He just learns or has been in the process of learning how to deal with it, right, so that he can still act in spite of it and in a way embrace it, kind of the way Gilgamesh ultimately embraces his own mortality. You know, you're still going to die, but you face it the right way. So this is transformation stage three. He's facing his fear. He's standing up. And it's an integration of his emotions, right? He's becoming more united in his personality. So this is important. Now, we go on to the development of the character, right? You've got the building of the Batman. He's creating for himself a symbol, which he already discussed with Alfred, and is going to require, you know, the costume, the mask, all the equipment that goes with it. you got the cave, which is going to be his headquarters. It's kind of like he's burying a certain part of himself down in the cave, and he emerges, you know, into the night to fight crime. And then he brings on with him certain allies, right? Alfred's always there, but you also are now introduced to characters of Lucius Fox, um, again, brilliantly casted, and James Gordon, I think, this is the best guy that's ever played the Gordon role also. And they both know the character from different perspectives, right? Alfred actually knows him the, be the best. Right? He knows him kind of as a father. He knows him as Bruce. He knows him as Batman. Fox kind of knows him mostly as Wayne. He's got an idea of what's going on. But then Gordon only really knows him as Batman. But they're all going to be allies to help him in his ultimate quest, which is um, you know, partly his own development, but again, crime-free Gotham. Now, it's kind of interesting when you're dealing with this idea of the mask, you know, putting on a disguise. Superhero comics, I mean, this is one of the big things. Not that every superhero wears a mask. There is this idea of the secret identity, right? Even Superman, who is the first superhero, doesn't wear really a mask the way Batman does. He wears glasses when he's Clark Kent. Clark Kent is kind of the mask. Um, for Bruce Wayne, of course, this other mask is put on. And this is going to bring up another idea, um, you know, who are you deep down? And the movie brings this out in a couple of different scenes really um, brilliantly. So this very brief one is when the Batman first comes on the scene and is kind of taken down Falcone's guys at the, the big uh, drop with the drugs. And uh, Falcone is about to be captured by Batman. It's very short, but it's, it's awesome. Notice how it finishes, by the way. I'm Batman. Okay. Yeah, you know, short, sweet, the classic line. I mean, they started this back in the, the 1989 movie with Michael Keaton, the, uh, the Tim Burton version. I don't know how many of you have seen the Tim Burton version. But, you know, I'm Batman. You know, he asks what, not who, he doesn't ask who are you. He actually asks what are you. Um, but the idea in the same, the same question is, you know, what are you deep down? Um, and now he's admitting the truth at this point. He's Batman. All right, and we're going to see how Rachel deals with this by the end of the film. But the thing that I really like about this scene is not just how he responds to the question, but the way they work back into that coat, right? This is this idea of the transition has become complete in a way, right? He's looking back. That's the guy he gave the coat to when he departed, when he answered the call, when he needed to change, when he began the change. So it's kind of looking back at who he was and who he has now become, kind of this, you know, full circle type of a thing. So kind of interesting. Again, this is, I think, just good writing and directing. So then let's look at now what he's going to do with the Bruce Wayne persona, right? He's taken on this mask of Batman, but he's also going to take on a secondary mask in how he presents himself as Bruce Wayne. So here he is playing the role of the billionaire playboy. Bruce? Rachel? I'd heard you were back. What are you doing? Uh, just swimming can change the world on your own. What choice do I have? When you're too busy swimming. Rachel, all of all this, it's, it's not me. It's... Deep down, you may still be that same brave kid you used to be. But it's 
It's not who you are underneath. It's what you do that defines you. Another great line. It's what you do that defines you, right? So here's the question right from the beginning. You know that he's putting on an act. You know this is not who he really is. It's a, it's a show. Uh, but then the question with the Batman character is, you know, is he mentally unstable? I mean, they even bring that up. That, you know, you give him a straight jacket to put the metal on, right? Is he crazy? Is it, what kind of person would actually do this? Um, clearly, there's something unhinged. So he's developing into this persona. There's the mask that he's wearing. And when he comes out and he encounters Rachel, the thing that I really love, if you just watch the expression on his face, it's almost like he's a kid again, right? He's looking back at this person that has, you know, kind of defined his childhood in a way. Um, and then he kind of says, you know, I'm not, it, it's not what it looks like, right? He's, uh, you know, pushing the idea that there, there's more to him. If only she could see it. Of course, he can't come out and, and, and do this. As part of being successful in his mission, he needs to put on this mask, to put on this role. And the mask, at this point, happens to be Bruce Wayne, which brings up that question, who you are on the inside, which is what she's addressing. You know, what's the real you? The word that we're going to look at here is persona. And we could talk a little bit about what that means, because that's another archetype, the archetype of the persona versus the archetype of the self. So as we build this character of the Batman, the persona is the mask. Right? This is something that we all have. We all have masks that we wear. It's a social face that we present to other people. It actually conceals who we are underneath, which is why I think you know, the whole superhero genre is interesting in that respect because it really plays with that idea. The word itself goes all the way back to the ancient theater. Um, it comes from a Latin term, and when you talk about ancient theater, if you're not familiar with Greek tragedy um, and drama, they would wear masks, right? There's the mask of drama, or sorry, tragedy, there's a mask of comedy. And when you play a role, you put on the mask because you're putting on a new persona, okay, to present to the audience. That's the whole idea of acting, right? The dangerous part of playing with the persona is that you can potentially become one with that personality, right? You, you, you tend to embody that mask or really become one with the mask in a way you shouldn't. Now, we're often unconscious of how we do this. I mean, not always. I mean, sometimes we're aware that we do this. And if you stop and actually think about how you behave, you'll see the masks that you put on. When you go and interact with certain people, you put on a certain mask. If you're out interacting with your parents, you behave one way. If you're out in public with your friends, you very often behave a different way. You have a different persona that you put on when you go to work versus the way you, what you do in school, and on and on it goes. Okay, obviously with Batman, it's much more visually uh, intimidating, right? It's a very physical mask, but that's still the same idea. And it's Bruce Wayne that is also the persona, right? It's also a mask that he's playing with. Whereas the self is what the ultimate goal is, right? This psychic whole, right? A conjunction of both the unconscious aspects of our personality and the conscious aspects of our personality and the whole process of individuation and growing and transforming is to assimilate those two halves into a unified whole, right? So when we talk about various goals, whether it's the goal of ridding Gotham of crime, whether it's the goal of conquering our fear, in the end, the ultimate goal, and ultimate means the last thing you seek or the highest thing you seek, is to become this unified person, uh, personality, this unified self, right? To individuate, to develop in the way you need to develop. And that's what he's going through, okay? So let's take a look at masks a little bit more because there's another character that wears a mask as well, and that's the Scarecrow, right? This uh, shadow figure. Falcone first encounters him. We see how Crane puts on the mask to bring out the fear as he drugs Falcone and literally drives him crazy. But then Batman or Bruce Wayne, Batman actually, encounters the Scarecrow as well. So you have another mini descent woven into the film where, uh, if you don't remember the scene, it's in the apartment where he drugs Batman and lights him on fire. And then as he's burning, he falls out of the window into the rain, into the dark, down into the city. So it's, again, quick, clearly a descent. And he crashes to the ground below, calling back all of that primal fear that he's thought he's dealt with. Of course, it's chemically induced, and it's harder to, 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 to deal with in that situation. But it's this flashback, right? You see, as he comes out of it, a flashback to that moment as Alfred is bringing him safely back in the limousine, right? He's picturing his father rescuing him from the well and the bats. Okay, so there's that aspect. Finally, we get to the end of the story. We're getting to the culmination. You get the arch enemy finally revealed. Uh, you thought Ducard was 
just one of the member of the League of Shadows, we find out that Ducard is Ra's al Ghul all along. Now, the setup for this scene is he's just rescued Rachel, um, who's been drugged. He has this big car chase back to the Batcave. Uh, he's been given the antidote. And then he's got this birthday party going on upstairs. And Alfred kind of counsels him on how he should handle his guests and what he's doing wrong as Batman. We'll get to that in a second. But right after that, he kind of clears the house, putting on a little bit more of a show as Bruce Wayne. And then he's confronting Ra's al Ghul. It should be you standing by my side, saving the world. I'll be standing where I belong. Between you and the people of Gotham. Okay, I should pause it there for a second. Um, because that's what we've been talking about with the hero, right? The hero is the figure that stands in between, right? Between nature and culture, between the danger out there and the people back here. So I love the way that they, they drew attention to that. Okay, so that's pretty good. Um, but it goes on. This is a kind of a long exchange where he's kind of revealing his ultimate plan, all that kind of stuff. I am going to stop you. I never did learn to mind your surroundings. Notice you've got the challenge again to, to his father's memory. I mean, he's accusing his father of lacking will and being responsible for his own death and not doing the things that he needed to do. But at the same time, it's kind of interesting how he says, you know, like your father, you, you know, lack the courage. So it's this idea that he's also recognizing the fact that Bruce is like his father, which is something that's really important for him to kind of have that um, reconciliation in a way with his father's memory and kind of embody the father and his um, uh his uh, reputation or the kind of the family name and stuff like that, which we'll come back to again in a second. But, you know, this is, again, going to the core of who Bruce Wayne is. And then at the very end, it brings back this idea of minding your surroundings, which is something that's come up during the training and comes up here and has come, come up again at the climactic battle at the end of the movie. So when you're looking at the various mentors, now we've got Ra's al Ghul revealed. We find out that that mentor is the adversary. The other mentor is the ally, Alfred. And of course, there's differences between the two. Right before this scene, remember I said Alfred is going to come along and give him a warning that what he's doing can't be personal. He can't be just a vigilante, right? He watched that scene, the chase scene. He knows what happened in the city and the havoc that it wrecked. Um, and he reminds Bruce right after that of his father's name, right? He, especially when he talks about the guests. He says, you know, those aren't just Bruce Wayne's guests out there. Those are your, uh, rather, it's not just your name. It's your father's name. It's all you have left of him, right? Right. Um, so and this whole idea of don't lose contact with that aspect of your personality, really important, right, uh, guiding him along. On the other hand, you've got the other mentor figure, Ra's al Ghul, who is obviously turned into adversary. He's the shadow that Bruce needs to confront. He's the trickster. He's beginning to literally orchestrate chaos in the city. It's not just the deception and the theatrics that he uses, but he's going to now tear down the entire structure of the city, turn Gotham back into literally a chaos in order to bring it back um, from the ashes, kind of like a phoenix. He, he hopes, hopefully, to, to resurrect the city in a, a better way. But to destroy crime, he's going to take a very extreme position. Okay, so the big difference between them is how they pursue the justice that they seek. And Bruce Wayne, of course, is saying, you know, I'm going to stop you. I'm not going to allow you to go down this path. And that's when he reminds him, you know, you need to be aware of your surroundings. There's always this call to remember what's going on, not to just go blindly into these situations. You have to be aware. Okay, and of course, he's going to take that lesson to heart. And that's going to be one of the, you know, catchphrases at the end of the film which I'm not going to show you. I'm going to show you one final catabasis since I've already been beating this dead horse. You know, all of the descent scenes, we got one final series of descents. It's going to really begin in this fiery inferno, the Wayne Manor burning up like hell itself, and he gets into the elevator, and they're actually going to drop down. Ah, Alfred. Perfectly played. Another descent into the pit. But the cool thing is Alfred goes with him, right? He's the father figure. Just like his father rescued him before, this time Alfred is there to kind of pick him up when he's fallen, right? He's at the pit, and you know you're getting near the climax of the film when you've reached the darkest point. He thinks his whole family's legacy is in utter ruins. He's failed in what he's trying to do. Of course, Alfred reminds him there's more to the family's legacy than, you know, what was up there, bricks and mortar, okay? And then he reminds him, again, why do we fall? And um, on and on it goes. Okay, he's going to encourage him. He's going to kind of motivate him for this next encounter. And, of course, the rest of the catabasis is that he's going to go into Gotham, right? He's going to go in where the fear gas has been released, where everything is breaking loose as um, 
a hell, right? Again, this is where he is. So there's the descent into the cave. And now let's get into the city and see what happens when you get to the moment of truth. So in the midst of his fighting the League of Shadows and um, trying to save everybody from the chaos that's erupting, he um, encounters Rachel, who's just saved this boy. Um, kind of a comment if you're a Game of Thrones fan, I a lot of times point out to my students, I don't know if you guys pick up some of the actors that show up, um, since I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan, I don't like to let these things slide, but there's actually a couple actors from Game of Thrones that are in the movie. One of them we've actually seen in some of these clips earlier. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, the Joe Chill character that killed his parents, but he actually is uh, a pretty significant character in Game of Thrones. And if you're a Game of Thrones fan, you can put into the chat box who you think he might be in Game of Thrones. You would not recognize him because in the Game of Thrones series, he doesn't look anything like he actually does uh, because of makeup. But this character here is also somebody that is in Game of Thrones and is not nearly as repulsive as the character he played in that show. I think you can recognize it. I'll maybe give you the answers to those questions after we watch this clip. You could die. At least tell me your name. It's not who I am underneath. But what I do that defines me. Okay, I love it when they hit the music at the right spot. He's just revealed who he is in kind of a subtle way, a flashback to that big question of, you know, who you are on the inside, deep down, the real you, big theme in the story, great moment. Um, good, I've got some answers here. Littlefinger, no. Night King is the answer to the guy that played the, the, the Joe Chill character, right? The guy that killed his parents is actually, yes, was the Night King in Game of Thrones. Definitely looks different as the Night King. And then this kid looks pretty much the same. It's just a little bit old. Right, it's Joffrey. Very nice, very nice. Glad I have some Game of Thrones fans among my students. All right, let's move on because we are now at the final battle. Fear has been unleashed, like I said. All hell's broken loose. You have chaos and you're moving now towards the climactic battle. He's just revealed his identity. And then we have the encounter with Ra's al Ghul on the train. I'm not going to show you the clip. Um, it's more of a fight. Not a lot happens dialogue-wise, except for the final line when he kind of turns that um, phrase back on Ra's al Ghul. He says, you know, you never did learn to mind your surroundings as he defeats the enemy, right? So this, again, is his climax, uh, conquest of death motif. Um, and interestingly, it goes back to this whole idea of does Batman kill? Clearly, he needs to deal with this guy. It doesn't seem likely that they're both going to survive where they are. But he makes it clear that he's not going to take his life, at least actively, um, but he doesn't have to save him, right? I don't have to, I won't kill you, but I don't have to save you, right? Is a line right before he blows out the back of the train and, 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 and kind of parachutes out. And then Ra's al plummets to his death, as far as we know. And I think, you know, we don't see him again in the trilogy, so yeah, I think he's dead. Anyways, uh, the question that comes up ethically is, you know, what kinds of responsibilities do we have when it comes to moral obligation? Is it just a matter of the actions we choose to take uh, versus the inaction that we sometimes employ, right? Are you equally responsible when you don't act as to when you do act? Um, so again, you could question whether or not this is um, still tantamount to him killing uh, the character. Um, but again, it's interesting to look at this. Yeah, good, good point. It was interesting that he saves his life earlier in the film, and it's kind of the same type of moment. He has the opportunity to do it again, possibly, um, but doesn't take it. Uh, obviously, he probably regrets in some ways saving the character as he did earlier in the film, but um, again, pivotal moment. But it's ultimately the end of the transformation, right? When you, when you defeat the enemy, when you have the conquest of death, the uh, transformation is complete. You get an idea that he has a code now, uh, and he, he isn't aware of what's going on. He does mind his surroundings in the battle. And that's essentially the end of Act 2. Okay? Threat averted, or destruction averted, threat dealt with. And we move into Act 3. And again, Act 3, it's usually pretty brief. I love the way they do it. They do it in a few different scenes. Um, and again, it's going to bring us back to the idea of redemption with the Father. Right? We talked about Star Wars. The pivotal moment I thought was in Return of the Jedi when Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader kind of have this, I don't want to say reunion because they never, never had a union to begin with, but you know, when Darth Vader comes back, right, to the, to the good side, when he kind of redeems himself and dies in the process. For Bruce, it's, it's not really a redemption of his father because his father didn't do anything like turn evil like Darth Vader, but 
is a redemption of his father's legacy, is a redemption of his father's memory. It's a, the idea that he's no longer going to distance himself from who he is at that level. And you start off with, as a businessman, redeeming his father's company, where he's been buying up the stock, the company's gone public, and he reclaims the legacy there. I love that scene because you know, kind of turns it on. I forgot the guy's name, the character's name. Um, Rutger Hauer plays the character, another actor that I really love, but... Um, I want to say Mr. Fox, but that's Lucius Fox as the other character. I'll think of it later, probably. And then he redeems his family tradition, right? You have the scene where he's rebuilding the family home and picking out of the ashes the photographs of the family, the stethoscope of the family. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at that scene and see how it works out because you're also going to have his conversation with Rachel, which is really, really important. So let's take a look. And I found out about your mask. Your real face is the one that criminals now fear. The man I loved. The man who vanished. He never came back at all. But maybe he's still out there somewhere. Father would be very proud of you. Just like me. What will you do? Rebuild it. Just the way it was, brick for brick. Okay. There's actually quite a bit in that scene as well. I know the volume was a little bit low when they were kind of whispering back and forth. First, you've got the idea that here they are in the ruins of Wayne Manor, right? He's rebuilding it. And, you know, this idea of rebuilding it brick for brick, that's obviously a flashback. A lot of the lines that you've seen in the movie are refer you know, referring back to earlier lines in the movie. So here he's talking about the opposite of what he was talking about when he was saying he was going to tear down the whole manor, right? You know, every brick. Um, when he was talking about Al with Alfred, that was before the parole hearing, right? So obviously now we're, he's changed. He's a different guy. Um, the conversation that Rachel's having with him about him coming home and then the mask, right, that he's wearing, all right, it's all this romantic stuff. It seems like they're going to be able to be together. And then, of course, she backs off and says, you know, that's until I knew about your mask. And, of course, that changes everything. And then, you know, he thinks she's talking about Batman, but she's actually talking about Bruce Wayne, right? It's, it's, it's that mask. And even though the line is a little bit uncomfortable, it's not as natural when she says you're true face is now the face that criminals or the, the face that criminals now fear or something along those lines that's probably the one line in the whole movie that i think i don't want to say is cheesy but it's not delivered in a really convincing way the rest of her uh, discussion there i think was pretty good but the one thing that's interesting after she says that is the idea that she hopes that maybe one day when the city no longer needs batman that bruce wayne will be able to return and that's kind of the idea of, do we have a return at this point? Um, can, you know, the boy that went away return in the future? And I think the whole point of the heroic transformation motif for story is that they can't. Okay, that's what's happened, is that boy has died, right? In the sense that, that, that the person he used to be is no longer there. There might be glimpses of him, right? But he's changed. He's not the same character anymore. So, yeah, you really can't go backwards. You can't go back to that earlier time. You come in this return, which is, again, Act 3, but it's not a complete return, and especially in the Batman story because the story actually doesn't end here, right? This is just the beginning of the entire, uh, you know, Adventures of Batman um, stuff. So, again, Act 3, he finally has a self that has emerged. His true identity is obviously Bruce Wayne. Then you can still... I'm sorry, Batman is his true identity. You should probably know that for the quiz that you guys are going to take. Uh, Bruce Wayne really never came home. He's been transformed. He's a flashback to his father, which, as I said, they didn't do another flashback after we left Act 1, but they do. At the end, they actually have a flashback to him and his father with the stethoscope. So, again, very powerful and intimate moment in their lives. The very last part of the scene kind of lines up with Campbell's final stages, this idea of being master of two worlds. Right? When he's attained what he's sought, right? the boon, 
the thing that is the reward, he then brings it back. The hero brings it back in the return so that he can share it with other people. And you get this really neat mo- moment where he meets with Gordon at the very end of the movie. And we figure out, that, again, it's not really an end. You've got you know other adventures ahead of you. And they introduce kind of the idea of the Joker, whether they were, I don't think they were planning on the second movie being what it was, but they're kind of giving the fans a little um, Easter egg here with the, the Joker card being introduced at the very end. But you've got this idea that he now is going to share what he's learned with the people. He's now taken on this role of protector, and he's got this fight ahead of him. So it's not the end. It's just the beginning of a whole bunch of other adventures, okay? And a whole bunch, maybe not a whole bunch, but at least two other films in the series. So... Like I said, I don't know if originally they planned on it being a three-movie series, but it ended up being, again, a trilogy, which is kind of classic. You know, Star Wars, uh, Lord of the Rings, and Batman, uh, Christopher Nolan trilogy. If you enjoyed the first movie, which really is the origin story, you need to see the other films. Um, They can build on these themes in new ways. They're all unique, um, but at the same time, very much a unified whole. I think it's a really well-done series, so... Hopefully you enjoyed this overview, and again, I want this to be kind of training for you guys to be able to analyze movies on your own by looking at the motifs that we've studied, the archetypes, the pattern of the monomyth, the three-act structure, all the things that we went over in the Introduction to Hero Myths lectures, and now be able to apply it to a film. So I wanted to walk you guys through it. I know it was a little bit lengthy, but hopefully you got something out of it. Next time, we're going to actually turn our attention back to ancient mythology, and we're going to be covering, I believe, the story of the character known as Esfandiar, which is from the Persian epic of the Shanama. Okay, so that'll be next session.